<laughs> Words Good afternoon, of everyone. Yes, it got very silent very quickly. Good soda, just kind of all ready to rock and roll. So my name is Kate Wolford, and I serve as president of the McKnight Foundation, and it's really an honor to be with you today. We've been very pleased as a foundation to support the Courageous Conversations Project over the last two years. This project grew out of an effort to bridge some of the perceived urban-rural divides in the state of Minnesota, really looking at commonalities and honoring uniqueness of wonderful places that we have across the state. The project did this by hosting conversations and making connections across all parts of the state. And you'll see, I think in a few minutes, some scrolling of photos. This is a culmination of the project and you'll get to see if we had them, some photos. Oh, they were, okay. They were a second ago, so. The project was launched by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance led by Larry Jacobs. Everybody keeps moving. And Kate Semino. Kate's been running around making sure all logistics are great. So thank you to both of them. This project focused on the issue of Minnesota's aging workforce and how older adults can be part of the solution to keep Minnesota's economy strong and our communities thriving. And I see enough of us moving into that cohort that we can really appreciate this focus. Today, we're gonna to hear two valuable presentations. The first, we'll hear about the conclusion of the Courageous Conversations Project and its learnings and recommendations. The second, we'll hear from New York Times luminary columnist, Tom Friedman, who grew up very close by in St. Louis Park. Tom has been exploring what helps communities thrive in both urban and rural areas in a time of shifting politics and rapidly changing demographics. Thanks, Tom, so much for being here yet again. Let's begin now with Gary Eichten, another legendary, a legendary former NPR host and the moderator of the Courageous Conversation series, and a few of the guests from statewide listening sessions. Gary, it's all, all yours. Right. All Thank right. You. Thanks, Kate. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for the past two years, our group has been uh, traveling around the state, gathering information and listening to folks who have been wrestling with the very real issue of Minnesota's shrinking workforce. The numbers don't lie. Uh, Minnesota employers already say that they're having trouble finding enough workers to meet their needs. And this is only expected to get worse as time goes by. There just aren't going to be enough young people and immigrants to replace all the baby boomers who are expected to retire. And that hurts the Minnesota economy, no question about it. So what to do? Well, here's an idea. Uh, what if you could keep more of those older workers from leaving in the first place? Uh, maybe convince them to delay retirement for a year or two, maybe move into a, wor a part-time work situation, mentoring. Keep them on the job, in other words. Uh, it would be a boon to those older workers, no question about it, and it would also be a boon to Minnesota employers because you'd have fewer positions to fill. Odds are you would still have a labor shortage here in the state of Minnesota, but it would be a lot easier to deal with. So with that in mind, uh, we hit the road to find out what's being done and what could be done in different parts of Minnesota to address this issue. Started here in the Twin Cities, headed west to Marshall in southwestern Minnesota, went up north to the Iron Range in Chisholm, went over to Thief River Falls in northwestern Minnesota, and ended our journey in southeastern Minnesota in Austin. At each stop, we convened a group of local citizens, employers, community leaders. We asked a number of questions. Um, are employers having trouble filling positions in your community? Are employers willing to hire and retain older workers? Do older folks in your community actually want to continue working? And if so, what would make that an attractive option? Some of the questions we asked, there was another one. What about the strategies used by some communities to welcome new Americans? Uh, strategies which have produced some striking changes here in Minnesota. Needless to say, we learned a lot, asked a lot of questions, got a lot of great answers. I know I learned a lot. And we're joined now by three folks on stage who have helped us come up with a series of best practices and recommendations. Tom Quackenbush is from Redwood Falls, Michelle Ufford is from the Iron Range. Sadiq Abdurrahman lives here in the Twin Cities. 
And Tom, I'd like to start with you, if I could, from the uh, perspective of a private sector employer. When we were on stage in Marshall, I was struck by how you approached this issue at Dactronics, where you work. And first of all, remind us what Dactronics builds. Yeah, sure. So we build uh, video displays. Uh, you might be familiar with some of them you see on Sundays, uh, large video displays. Some are for the private market, some are for large stadiums, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Manufacturer of electronics. There's a theory that says it really can be a hassle for employers to keep older workers around. That, you know, it's, it's just a lot easier for them to go on their way. Is yeah. that true? You know, I, I'm finding that really. And so and the reason I know that is because we asked some questions of our of our current really highly skilled workforce is, is we have one-on-one -on -one conversations on a weekly basis with, with our employees. And we asked them, what, what does the, the next few years for you look like? How would you like your career to, to finish out? And, and what do you see for yourself afterwards? And those were very simple questions, but it did a couple of things. It allowed us to help them, you know, plan for their retirement years and, you know, be prideful in their succession planning. But it also allowed us to understand what it is that we need to do to support them in that but also we can make a plan for ourselves to say this individual might have two years, six months, five years, whatever that looks like, and plan for ourselves more accordingly. Now, if you have an older worker who wants to hang around for a while, what do they tend to do? Do they go part-time? Do they get into a mentor-type training yeah. position? How does that work out? So we got a little bit creative there. We asked uh, if, if some part-time employment would be interesting to them. If, what, what does that fit into their financial plan? Um, their time frame, maybe the time with their families, is that of interest or not? And we worked out a flexible schedule for them to be able to fill in maybe for some PTO time for some other employees, or we could, uh, you know, plan a, a, a sub line in, in a way for them to do some of that work in the days that we're willing to, to provide for us. I have a lot of uh, people taking you up on your... So, some do, some don't. And so we try to be respectful of you know, the, the time that they've earned in their life to, to take those next steps, however they would want to see that for themselves. So most have taken a very, you know, gracious attitude about that. Many come to us now and, and because they know we're, we're honest and we're, we're respectful of that time. And so they will often come to us and say, I'm thinking about retiring in June of 2021. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, but we, we record these things and we touch base, you know, things change. Um, there might be a, a personal situation with our family that, that might change those, those plans. And so we have a very open format to allow that conversation to happen whenever they're ready to have it. And you say that it's important for employers to start those conversations early and then continue them often. Yeah, we, we started a, a weekly conversation a couple of years ago, uh, mostly just to manage expectations and, you know, make sure that, that, that they're, the, the work that they're doing matches with what we expect and so forth. But that really allowed a, a trusting baseline to happen for us to, to continue that conversation into their retirement years. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you said in Marshall that I just loved uh, was, um, and I, more or less a direct quote, the old adage, you said, the old adage about treating people like you want to be treated isn't really true. Instead, employers should treat employees the way the employee wants to be treated. Yeah, that's exactly right. It sounds a little backwards, but you know, the way I grew up hearing that, but, but it's really true. Some people want, they want to be treated how they want to be treated. And as an employer, you have to be respectful of that. And so listening and truly listening to what that is and having a plan to act upon that, there, there's no better way to build trust than to actually follow through with the things you say you're going to do. And so listening in the way that they want to want it to be, and, and maybe sometimes you can't accommodate that, and that's, that's okay. I think there's, there's an honesty within that, but at least you're, you're able to have that, that common ground to allow us to move forward, however that is. Have you, uh, as you try to spread the gospel uh, in southwestern Minnesota, have you gotten a good positive response from uh, employers or do they, eh. you know, <laughs> we, we had a sidebar about this. Um, 
you know, really, this is really the only thing I can, I'm a bit of a control freak, uh, maybe. But one thing I do know is I can control what I do. I can't control what other people do. And so I take, try to take the perspective of, of doing what I can and what can I change in the way I think. And I, I think more employers have to be ready for that. They're expecting the workforce to change to them. And that's just not reality today, folks. Um, you've got to be able to be nimble and attractive as an employer and change your mindset and in going into those things instead of expecting the workforce to change to you. I should note that we, uh, Dactronics is not alone around the state. Uh, employers who are really doing a pretty good job here working with older aging workers. Uh, DigiKey up in Thief River Falls is a, is a real leader. Rochester City Bus Lines down in southeastern Minnesota, many, many others as well. But there are some great examples around the state. Michelle Ufford, you were part of our panel in Chisholm at the Minnesota Discovery Center, and you shared uh, your public sector expertise coming from Northeast Minnesota Office of Job Training. Among other things, we talked about uh, the issue of age discrimination. Now, what's interesting as we traveled around the state was that everybody denies there is such a thing. No, not in our area. That's somewhere else. It doesn't happen in our neighborhood, but it does. Well, Gary, you know, I, I don't know exactly that it's overt age discrimination. What I really do think, it's, it's more of a function to what Tom just said, is the fact of the matter is the vast majority of our employer base in Minnesota, particularly in greater Minnesota, are small businesses. And these are places with 20 employees or less, which means that they don't have HR folks sitting around with time to get creative on new strategies and how to tap into the older workforce or any number of other you know, cuts of the workforce that would be valuable for them to communicate with. And so in large part, it's just business as usual. It's, it's, uh, it's just a lack of time to be creative about strategies that would help them either retain their older workforce or attract older workers as well. Um, but there's a challenge to that too, because uh, we're in such a different job search landscape now compared to 10 years ago, 15, certainly 20 or 25 years ago when a lot of older workers may have last looked for work if, if they're recent retirees. Um, you know, it used to be where the one place everybody could go to find their local job openings was in the classified ads of their local newspaper. And we don't have local newspapers anymore, so where do you go? And that's, that's kind of the conundrum here is that um, we need to develop a, a more systematic approach to educating employers across Minnesota about the good things that Tom is doing and the other examples that you referenced, Gary. Um, but then we also need to help older job seekers figure out exactly how to find these opportunities. You know, with, with technology these days, um, it's all about online applications and job postings on websites and how do you find the postings? How do you know who's hiring? It really is, um, you know, technology is great. I'm a fan but it has fragmented how we make this match. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, I think that there is a very serious niche for services to help these small businesses figure out strategies that they can use to better tap into the older workforce, really take a look at their hiring practices, the requirements. Uh, does somebody really need a driver's license for a desk job? Does it need to be a full-time position? Are there opportunities for project-based learning? These are all the things that older workers um, are, are, are challenged by. And, and just incidentally, as I was driving down here thinking about this, what's funny to me about the scenario that we're in is that older workers now, older job seekers now, have a more similar uh, value set to the younger generation that everybody's always railing against. Like, they want flexible scheduling. They just started. They want this. They want that. <laughs> But if you stop and think about it, that's exactly what older workers are looking for right now. So a piece of it is is exactly to Tom's point, is employers to really change their mindset um, and and think about the part that they play in this because we are way, way past the uh, business as usual. Is there, a, is there a place for the employer who wants to do the right thing here where they could go and say, oh, gosh, we got to change uh, the application process or mm -hmm. we should do this or that, easy stuff that... Mm -hmm regular people could actually get around? Well, the short answer is not really. Um, the long answer is we do have a system here in Minnesota, public workforce development system, which is uh, where I've worked for the last 20 years. 
And we as a system, um, it was called the Minnesota Workforce Center System. We've just recently rebranded. We're now Career Force Minnesota. Our focus for decades has been on the job seeker. Um, not to say that we don't provide services for businesses, but we need to also shift how our system is approaching this. And it's like I said, it's it's not just older workers. It's immigrants. It's people from different backgrounds, maybe people who've been out of the uh, the job market for a long time. Um, but we need to get better as a system of, of this matchmaking. And, and, and there are so many different simple things a business can do to change their narrative when it comes to engaging older workers that we really need to be more deliberate about how we broadcast what those things are and then really have boots on the ground um, from all of our career force locations that can directly work with employers on a limited basis to take a look at their processes and their policies and their procedures. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to get there, but right now the, the answer is no. Early 20th century, uh, there was a huge influx of immigrants, mostly Europeans, mm -hmm. uh, to the Iron Range, mm -hmm. helping shape the region's uh, unique culture, personality, real melting pot, pot I would think you, you could say. Now, has that tradition continued? Uh, are you now seeing a large influx of immigrants from Asia, Africa? Absolutely not. And we need them. Please spread the word. Bring your friends and family. We have a serious workforce shortage in Northeast and, and honestly across the state. It's, it's not just us, but that is one area that we in that particular region have not benefited from. Um, but make no mistake, we, we are watching area and it's not always been an easy place for these communities to go through, to be welcoming to new people. So we've actually started having conversations in many of our communities across Northeast about what we can do now to open the minds of people who, who live there now, um, the Iron Range, but across the whole seven county region that, that I cover, uh, and how we can be more welcoming. Um, because we sure hope it's coming. We need it to come. Um, but it's, it's a thing that for an area that was completely based on immigration back when there was a difference between Finns and Germans and Swedes, um, that we just don't, we haven't benefited from that yet, but I, I, I look forward to the day that we do. Big influx of, uh, immigrants in Southwestern Minnesota. How has that panned out? Yeah. So I was, I was sharing with Gary that, uh, we, we dipped our toe into this, this water intentionally. So, uh, th there's a, a large, uh, Hmong population that's, that's congregated in, in Southwest Minnesota, but we were, we were not seeing applicants and we asked ourselves why, what are we, again, what can I do as an employer to help attract that? So, uh, we reached out to them intentionally, uh, one of their, uh, leaders, uh, who was a city council person invited them into the factory. Um, had him take a look around and give us some feedback. What, what is it that this, this population is looking for? It's two things. It's a good, good, uh, working environment in terms of, um, healthy air and, and good working conditions. The second thing was the, uh, the, um, um, the relationship they have with their supervisor. I think we do two of those things really well. So, so how do we spread the word there? He said, well, really, uh, we have seen no applicants. Um, we think we do those things well. How can we reach out to this population? And so uh, he suggested, well, really what they, how they, they share the, is through word of mouth. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to hire a bus and it's your job to fill the bus. And we're going to provide lunch and we're going to have the working, we're going to have the jobs working and you're going to see firsthand and I'd love to see 40, 45 people on that bus, which is what happened. And so we got them through. We had seven applicants. We hired them all that day. So we as an employer set up a strategy to make it happen, and it happened immediately for us. Sadiq, you yeah. got your start down there in Tom's country, southwestern Minnesota. Of course, now a long career, Twin Cities, information technology, government leadership. But your story actually started in southwestern Minnesota. That is true. And... I was really happy to go back uh, as 48 year old when I went to Marshall the first time. I was there and as a 21 year old looking for an employment and we came through South Dakota looking for an opportunity and we stopped by and this, the only Burger King that uh, the town had it for lunch. And that time there was a Heartland uh, Turkey factory that was looking for people. So we had very coincidentally, they had the HR person having lunch over there as well. So he looked at us and said, "You, what is this? Where are you guys from?" And uh, we 
we told him, he said, you're looking for a work? We said, yes, we were working during the night. So um, our start started there. What I, that demonstrates is if you give people an opportunity, uh, I think is in, in, in terms of uh, right now in the senior, senior, senior citizen, um, when I went back and listened to the uh, panels, what I realized is this is not really an issue um, for only employers. It's not an issue for uh, senior citizens. This is a collective issue that that all of us should be concerned. If you look at the demographic shift in Minnesota, you have over 41 percent of uh, of a rural area that is over over 50. Um, I'm 49 now, so I'm very close to that mark. So it's really a very concerning thing. Um, also, I think it's really important to debunk. I mean, what we have to debunk some of the myth. And what we realize is uh, the senior citizens are really stable. Um, they they perform their job very well. They love what they do. They they like. They're not migrants. They want to stay where they are. And I think it's not a lot to ask to accommodate their needs. You know, we, we have to look at the holistic approach and um, cross-sector partnership will be very important. The um, small communities already function as a, as, a, as a very integrated communities. So if you have public partnership, non nonprofit and private sector working together, I think that would be a great approach. Now, we found uh, as we travel around the state that a lot of older adults, uh, including older immigrants who've been in the workforce for a long time, actually want to or need to continue working. I mean, that's not everybody feels that way, but a large number of people do. And I would think that's a good thing. I mean, we need to need that expertise, that experience. Do you agree with that? I, I definitely agree. And I think that our greatest gift as immigrants is to, for uh, to you is providing and help being helpful in taking up jobs that is not really a lot of people need. And when you look at things right now, the immigration policies in the United States, and you're looking at the aging workforce that we have, and the labor shortages, that is a reason why we need to consider, in, and uh, we need to consider. I understand, I sincerely understand the demographic change is, is sometimes what is propelling some of these uh, negative things, because America is going to look like a different place in 2040. Uh, but that doesn't really mean that our kids who, is, who are changing those demographics are like us. So it's very important to know that. My son, I have two kids now in the University of Minnesota. One of his political science second year, he's taking a Somali class at the university. <laughs> okay, so we speak English at home. His teacher, who is Somali, sent him an email saying, why are you taking this class? You need to uh, opt out. He says, no, I don't know nothing about Somali. <laughs> <laughs> So what you, they might look more, they might look, uh, and they might look, uh, in refer, their reflection might look like us, but they are more like you in other, in any other way. So we want to make sure that in a smaller part communities who have not experienced these demographics, what we need to do this in a, in a, an incremental approach. We have to really talk to people and and, and to education. Sadiq, thanks. And thanks to uh, Michelle, Tom. Thanks to everybody who's been participating in this project. Uh, I'm no expert on the subject, no question about that, but I have been struck by how important this issue of the aging workforce actually is to the older workers, of course, but also to Minnesota employers who want to make a buck and to the Minnesota economy, which hopefully will continue to thrive. This is a big deal. And I've also been struck by how very little attention the subject gets. Uh, when we talk about the labor shortage, we hear a lot about automation, training young people, trying to convince people who live in Arkansas to move here, whatever. All of this is very important. There's no question about it. But virtually nothing is said about taking advantage of the older workers who are already here on the job. I hope this project will shed some much needed light on that part of the subject because I don't think we can really afford to lose all that talent and experience. Anyway, it's been a hoot to participate. Thanks a lot. Larry, where are you? I want to thank these panelists. Um, and I want to particularly thank Gary Eichten, who's 
for me, the Walter Cronkite of Minnesota. <laughs> Um, so we're going to now shift gears a little bit and invite uh, Tom Friedman in a moment uh, to join us. And our thought today was to try to broaden our conversation uh, a bit in, in a couple different ways. Um, Tom has been doing a series in the New York Times where he's a, 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 a famous columnist called Rising Communities. Uh, and after the election of Donald Trump, which you may remember as inaugural, referred to the carnage in America, uh, Tom Freeman did something which few reporters do and very few prominent national reporters do, but he does all the time. He got in a car and he went and talked to people in the South and the Midwest. Uh, he's written about Wilmer, Minnesota in a terrific column. If you're not familiar with it, please read it. it you'll see some overlap with the Courageous Conversation series. And the other thing about Tom is that he is a global citizen. So as we were emailing, and I don't even know how this is possible. A few days ago, literally, he was in China. Then he was emailing or texting from the streets of Hong Kong. And this morning he was in Red Wing. <laughs> um, and so this is, a, I think, a terrific privilege for us here today to hear from Tom Friedman. We'll start off talking about rising communities and we'll see where that goes. Please give a warm welcome to Minnesota's Tom Friedman. Thank you. This is, this is terrific. It's great to do a neighborhood concert. And uh, as Paul Simon said in Central Park. Um, Larry, thank you for having me here. I've learned so much from Larry and the opportunities I've had to come back to the Humphrey School. And I totally agree that uh, Gary Eichten is the Walter Cronkite of uh, <laughs> Minnesota and, and of, uh, of his generation. Um, I was thinking, listen, you know, to the panels, it was so interesting, uh, aging your know, workforce and, and the absence of enough workers. I, 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 was, I am the only person who's been to Shenzhen and Reading in the last two weeks, you know. Um, <laughs> and somebody along the way on this trip stole, told me a story of a, uh, back in when the Soviet Union existed and, you know, you had to wait uh, usually five years to get a car. And a guy finally saved up all his rubles. He saved up to buy a lot, I think they were called, you know, these Soviet-made cars. And, Came, he put the money down as the, the dealer, as it were, and, and the guy said, your, your, your car will be delivered. Um, if, it was, if it was today, it, it would be delivered in, on February 18th, um, 2026. And um, the guy said, oh, no. The dealer said, what's wrong? He said, that's the day the plumber's coming. So, <laughs> it's the day. so it's, uh, so you think we got it bad, you know? But I, I will tell you a real story. I um, flew in yesterday and I was going to play golf with my friend Cal Simmons, who's here, and I had it all figured out. I was going to land at 215. I was going to get my luggage at 230. I was going to get my Avis rent a car at 245. And, um, and I got to the Avis desk and um, uh, th did they buy budget or something? Because the budget desk was next to it and they had no employees. So the people were lined up at budget and at Avis and they didn't have enough employees. And then when you had to get out of the lot, they only had one, you had to wait 15 minutes to get out of the lot because they only had one gate open. And I just said, I'm sure this is because they just couldn't find employees, you know? So good news and bad news story. So, you know, as Larry said that um, I've been uh, uh, trying to understand what's happening to local communities. Uh, I got into this first really because uh, in my last book, Thank You for Being Late, I ended in Minneapolis and, um, uh, and in St. Louis Park to try to understand um, what had been going right in, in these places. And um, uh, so let me just sort of give you the quick uh, schema of, of how I think about this, this, uh, this problem. Because, you know, uh, the cliche of America today is that we're a country divided between two coasts. Uh, two coasts that are liberalizing, pluralizing, diversifying, and modernizing. And then there's flyover America where everyone's high in opioids, voted for Trump, and waiting for 1950 to come back. You know, so... <laughs> Um, that's, uh, that's the cliche. And uh, of course, you only have to be from flyover America uh, to know that ain't true. Um, and what I have discovered in my travels is actually America is a checkerboard today. It's a checkerboard of towns and cities that are rising from the bottom up and towns and cities that are collapsing from the bottom down um, into all of the tragedies of opioid abuse, unemployment, suicide that you've read about. And I've visited both. 
And the most interesting thing about that dichotomy is that sometimes the communities that are rising are literally right next door to a community that's fallen. Um, and so it is an East Coast, West Coast, North, South. Um, and so I profiled um, uh, Wilmer, Minnesota, which was a real contrast with St. Cloud. I profiled uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is surrounded by Reading, York, and Harrisburg that are falling off the earth. And so um, I profiled Louisville um, uh, and towns in Southern Indiana that were, were collapsing. So I really been intrigued. Why does, what are the ingredients, the common denominators, why one rises and another falls? And I've developed a kind of uh, checklist and uh, but I saw it just in spades this morning at, at Red, in Red Wing, which is just amazing uh, community that just checks every one of these boxes. And um, so let me just start at 30,000 feet um, because none of this is happening um, in a vacuum. It's actually happening in a context of rapidly accelerating change uh, in three areas. And the way I like to uh, think about this is that um, uh, I think we're actually going through three climate changes at once right now. Um, we're actually going through a change of the climate of the climate. Uh, we're going from what I call later to now. So when I was growing up in St. Louis Park in the 50s and 60s, later was when I could clean that river, purify that lake, rescue that orangutan. I can do it now, I can do it later. Uh, today, later is officially over. Later will now be too late. So whatever you're gonna save, please save it now. That's a climate change. Second, we're going through a change in the climate of globalization. Uh, we're going from a world that was interconnected to a world that's interdependent. And that's a very different world. In an interdependent world, you get a geoeconomic inversion. First of all, your friends start to be able to kill you faster than your enemies. Uh, if Greek and Italian banks had gone under last night, um, <clears throat> I might have had to call Larry and say, Larry, I, I, I'm just too busy. Uh, Greek and Italian banks went under last night. Wait, Greece and, and Italy, they, they're in NATO. They're in the EU. They're allies. But if they go under, uh, if they'd gone under last night, you, you all would have felt it. Uh, and in an interdependent world, your rival falling actually becomes more dangerous than your rival rising. So if China had taken six more islands in the South China Sea last night, don't tell anybody, couldn't care less, um, had China lost 6% growth last night, Larry would have been calling me to say, uh, Tom, our session is canceled because the impact on all of us would have been so devastating. That's a climate change. And lastly, we're going through a change in the climate of technology and business. So uh, in the world is flat, one of the things I argued, um, the reason I'm the foreign affairs columnist, but I spend all this time interviewing companies is I'm not interested in their profit or loss or who their next president is or what are their stock price. I'm a big believer that whatever can be done, be done. <clears throat> the only question is will it be done by you or to you, by a competitor or a bad guy? And they're always early adopters, both of them. So I'm always really interested what can be done. So I go to AT&T or I go to IBM or I go to Google or I go to Cisco and all I'm interested and in, I ask them all the same question, what's happening at the tip of your spear? What, what can you do now that you couldn't do before? Because I'll arise that into technology, uh, weaponry, geopolitics. So I believe what can be done today is every company can uh, sensorize, that is they can capture, they can put sensors on everything now and capture all the data around their business. They can then use that <coughs> data to analyze and find the needle in the haystack of their data now as the norm, not the exception. They can then take that needle of data and optimize off it uh, to get the ideal optimum benefit. I flew in on United Airlines, GE engines connected in real time to General Electric and telling United Airlines exactly what altitude to fly each mile to optimize their energy efficiency. They can do that now because they got 26,000 sensors in the engine connected in real time to GE. They can then prophesize off that data. You've probably seen the IBM Watson ad. IBM Watson repairman shows up at a high rise, says I'm here to fix the elevator. Doorman says the elevator's not broken. IBM Watson repairman says I know, but it will be in six weeks and three days, okay? Uh, so you can prophesize off that data now. You can uh, localize off that data just for the neighborhood around the Humphrey School. You can customize off that data just for guys from Minnesota with a mustache and brown eyes. You can digitize and automatize off that data to create new jobs, products, and services. That is a climate change. And every single business in Minnesota and around America is working through that progression. Uh, McKinsey's latest study estimates about 20% of businesses are through that climate change now, which means 
still to go. So we're actually in the middle of three climate changes at once. What do you want when the climate changes? You actually want two things. You want resilience. You need to take a blow because stuff happens around you really unexpectedly and really fast. And you also want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You want to be curled up under the chair here with me saying to Larry, Larry, come out. The climate change is over, OK? So, um, uh, so the big, the central political question, I believe, of our time is how you produce resilience and propulsion in the middle of three simultaneous climate changes at once. So as I thought about that, I thought, well, who do I go to for advice on how you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? Uh, and then I realized I knew this woman. Uh, she was 3.8 billion years old. Her name was Mother Nature, and she'd been through more climate changes than anybody. Uh, so I called her up, made an appointment, went out to see her. And um, uh, I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? And in my last book, I created Mother Nature's political party based on her answer, uh, uh, which is, what I think, the central political challenge of, of our time. So that's the framework within which I'm operating. And that's what brought me um, first to Lancaster, first to Louisville, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, um, uh, in southern Indiana, and then to Lancaster, Pennsylvania last year. So I'll tell you the story of Lancaster, Wilmer, and Red Wing, and then Larry and I can um, uh, do, do a little deeper dive. Um, so when my book, Thank You for Being Late, came out, my lecture agent called me, said, you got a lecture invitation to speak in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for something called the Hourglass Foundation. I said, fine, great, sign me up. Um, date came, well, actually a week before the date, my agent called me and said, um, I didn't tell you, but you have to do a 90 minute reception before the lecture with the people. I said, Carlton, named Carlton said, I said, Carlton, you are killing me. Uh, I got to do a 90 minute reception standing up before the lecture. He said, yeah, 90 minute reception. So I go out there and um, uh, I go to the reception and suddenly people are coming up to me saying, hi, I'm from the Lancaster Health Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Youth Employment Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Adult Unemployment Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Lead Abatement Coalition. I'm from the Lancaster Minorities Protection Coalition. I realized I'm in some amazing place. And by the time the lecture was done, I'd already picked the two dates to come back and interview everybody at the Hourglass Foundation, named by the fact that the hour was late. Because in the early 90s, Lancaster was a dying town, um, a dying city. No one would go downtown. Um, about 600,000 people in the greater Lancaster area. Um, in the far off countryside, a lot of Amish and Mennonite. Uh, the inner city is about 50% Puerto Rican. Really interesting complex of people. And, um, and I came back and, and told the story about how Lancaster uh, almost fell off the face of the earth in the early 1990s. And um, last year was named one of the 10 coolest cities in America by, For by Forbes magazine. One of the 10 coolest cities in America. So what's the first thing... Um, uh, you see in all these cities, I saw it in Red Wing, I saw it in Lancaster, I saw it in Wilmer in different ways. The first thing is that they are faced with an urgent need to change. Uh, in Lancaster's case, it was, it was, city was just going to die. And they had lost their biggest factory, Armstrong Tile, um, uh, which was both moving and changing its, its business. Um, uh, in Wilmer's case, I know a lot about Wilmer. Um, so the first thing is, Urgency, you know, uh, necessity is not just the mother of invention, but it's also the mother of inclusion. Uh, and so I'll explain to you that in Wilmer's case. So I know a lot about Wilmer because in 1949, my aunt and uncle, Bev and I, Rosema, moved to Wilmer after the war and started a little steel company. And um, uh, the town at the time was 99.999% white, Protestant, Scandinavian, and uh, Lutheran, and German, and three Jewish families, one of whom was my aunt and uncle. And um, uh, so I spent 50 years visiting Wilmer every summer and every winter. So I had a real depth perception on Wilmer. And one day, I don't know, it was whew, probably about in the 1970s, um, my aunt came down to the Twin Cities for some family event and she pulled me aside and she said, Tom, I was in the grocery store last weekend and I heard someone speaking Spanish. Spanish, 
Spanish. <laughs> could have been Martian. It could have been for her. That was the other had arrived in Wilmer. And I, I just never forgot it. You know, it's just one of those conversations that you never forget. Um, so as I started doing my cities things, I, um, uh, my friend Dana Mortensen uh, uh, connected me with Hamza Warfa, who works for the state. And I have a, a very close Israeli friend who is an expert on Israeli communities. And the four of us went off to Wilmer. It was like the, uh, the punchline to a joke, so an Israeli, a Somali, and two Minnesotans <laughs> walk into a bar in Wilmer, you know, and, um, uh, and um, so first we go to Wilmer High, and um, uh, Wilmer High now has a stainless steel map, a uh, you know, giant one, uh, hanging over the lobby. Uh, principal met us there, and I uh, explained that at the beginning of every school year, the incoming class puts pins in every country the different kids at this school are from, because Wilmer today is almost 50% Somali and Latino. Um, that is a radical change. And that stainless steel map was donated by the people who bought my aunt and uncle's steel company. So the whole thing had come full circle for me. So um, uh, the necessity for Wilmer was that um, there's zero, there's zero, basically zero unemployment in Wilmer. If you can fog up a mirror, you get a job in Wilmer, okay? <laughs> so um, uh, as a uh, ag scientist, basically, or as a Genio turkey factory, I mean, the whole spectrum, you can get a job. Um, and that was the mother of inclusion. Because the employers basically said, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what country you came from. I only care about your soft skills. Can you wake up, get up, dress up, sit up, clean up, work up, and shut up? And if you can do that, um, you can get a job in Wilmer, Minnesota. Okay. So that really busts through all the um, uh, kind of resistance to inclusion. Now, if you follow in Wilmer politics, you'll know they had real problems. Smaller woman had a pig's foot thrown at it. All the things you'd expect in a, in a community um, you know, coming to terms with, with that kind of rapid accelerating demographic change. But they got through it, and this is then the second thing all these communities have in common, because they have a high density of leaders without authority. So leaders without authority are a hugely important category. They're just community leaders, sometimes been in the town for eight generations, who just say, not gonna happen here. This town is not gonna die on my watch. So in Lancaster, it's Art Mann, owned a manufacturing company there, and I sat in on the meeting every Friday morning at Art Mann's kitchen table, and the leaders without authority from Hourglass Foundation in Lancaster sit around his table, and they just talk about the stuff that has to be done. Two rules at Art Mann's table. One is any idea you suggest, you have to be ready to do, okay? You yourself, we're not interested in you floating ideas. And the second is you see that hook on the door uh, before you came in, hang your politics on that hook. Uh, because our politics here is called what works. We are not interested in your left right politics. So put it on the hook outside the door and then you can come in. Our politics is what works, okay. So, um, so what you see, these are very uh, unique uh, people who um, uh, are really love their communities, really believe in them, and simply refuse uh, to let them die. And the third thing that happens then is that they network together in what I call complex adaptive coalitions. So uh, again, I study nature a lot. I believe nature is the best teacher for what happens when the climate changes. And uh, the, the um, the ecosystems that survive when the climate changes have two things in common. One is they build complex adaptive networks. All the elements of the ecosystem reinforce one another to strengthen the system as a whole. And they're almost always polycultures, not monocultures. So one disease can't wipe them out. Same with communities. So if you have a polycultural community, that is your town is invested in a lot of different potential businesses, um, so the death of one won't, won't knock them out. And the other is they build complex adaptive coalitions where the business community partners with the education community, partners with the philanthropic community, partners with the social entrepreneurship community, partners with the mayor, and they build a complex adaptive coalition to manage the climate change. So that's, a, that's another very, very big feature. Um, uh, another feature 
is that um, they understand what their particular value add is. So in Lancaster, um, it was um, uh, it was tourism. Actually, a lot of people come to see the Amish and Mennonite areas. Uh, and the Amish and Mennonites are also very good craftspeople. Um, and so they, they built off a, a lot of that. Um, I was just with the head of Minnesota State College in Red Wing, and they have two remarkable programs there that draw students from as far away as China to Red Wing at their state college. One is how to repair band instruments. There are only three schools in the world that teach how to repair band instruments. And the other is how to build uh, violins and guitars. And um, uh, what was the third one? Um, I gotta remember that, uh, Matt, do you remember what the third one was? It was, oh, oh bike, bicycle repair um, and, uh, and manufacture. But Red Wing, of course, has Red Wing, um, uh, the shoe company. Um, they, uh, they have, a, and this is another thing that all these communities have in common, they have very strong public assets, okay? Now, in Red Wing, it's a beautiful community theater that anchors the downtown. In Lancaster, what helped turn around Lancaster was they got the minor league baseball team to agree to build their, their stadium downtown and not in town. And then the two biggest institutions in the city, Franklin and Marshall University and the local hospital, agreed to repair all the houses on the street connecting them. And these sort of core assets um, then brought more and triggered, et cetera. And then they had a bad mayor, they got a good mayor, and um, they eventually built a, built a convention center uh, and a Marriott hotel in the heart of the city. And that's what then started to bring people back to downtown. And that got built because of a bond issue in which the Democratic mayor and the um, uh, Republican congressman joined hands uh, in order to get the bond issue through and get the federal guarantees for it. And wouldn't you know, when that Republican congressman was running for re-election, the Democratic mayor forgot to endorse the Democrat running against him. <laughs> Just go figure, you know? Um, uh, so that's kind of how it works. They build these complex adaptive coalitions. Uh, they have anchor institutions. They have very high density of what I would call public wealth. Parks, uh, churches, libraries, community groups, um, lots of public, uh, uh, very healthy public institutions that then the leaders without authority all reinforce and, and, uh, and connect through. So um, those are just some of the features I've seen in these communities. You know, Larry, we can talk about more, but um, that's, um, uh, that's what I learned in Red Wing and Wilmer and Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Thank you. <laughs> I'm already hooked up, so there, I'm there, okay. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> This is Kate Semino right here. She's responsible for why we're sitting here. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. <laughs> As always. I mean that both like epistemologically <laughs> and very in terms of logistics. She's the person. Uh, thank you very much, Tom Friedman. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about, and uh, there are question cards walking around. Let me just say uh, we have a bias towards questions that challenge. The only reason we do this is to make it more feasible for our friends in the media who want to take a clip. If you've got 30 people all raising their hands, it's, it creates a challenge. And frankly, rather than taking a program for 200 people and bringing it to 2 million, that doesn't happen. So that's why we do it. It's strictly for logistical reasons. Um, Tom, let me jump in on um, the Rising Communities Project, which is, if you haven't read this series, it's quite remarkable. And I, it looks to me like the, the times kind of blew through their usual word limit. You get like these supersized columns to really go in depth, which doesn't happen um, on the what's known as the op-ed page. That is opposite the editorial page. So one of the big themes in- Let me say you know, one reason we can do it. I actually now write two versions of every column. So I write 825 words for the Dead Tree edition, because um, that's the limit in the newspaper. And because it's online now, there's actually no limit. And um, so they will let me- on occasion, write a three thousand word column with photographs. Yeah, with photo, we sent a photographer to Wilmer, and um, and by the way, that was the number one trending item in the New York Times that day. Wow. Story on Wilmer, Minnesota, <laughs> which shows you that you you um you don't have to write about Donald Trump every time, you know, to um, uh, uh, to get attention, you know, that 
people are actually interested in these things. Same with Lancaster. Um, you know, I say just one thing about Lancaster, a, a backstory that happened, because I wrote that in July of, uh, not last July, but the July of I guess 20, 2018. And um, uh, I was out in Colorado at the time um, on vacation because it was summer, and um, it took me a while to write the column. And the day before the column came out, maybe the day of, my brother-in-law, we were on vacation with the family, uh, came to me and said, hey, that was too bad about Lancaster. I remember you were writing about Lancaster. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, I was just watching CNN. Um, a white policeman tased a black man in uh, Lancaster, and um, someone had their camera there and said, three million Facebook views. I said, you, you're kidding, right? I mean, of all, Lancaster, Pens, I'm, I'm just about to write this column about Lancaster. And um, so I called the mayor. There's a, a woman in her 30s, and she basically, got, she was almost crying. You know, I mean, what had happened? And um, obviously felt terrible. And um, it turned out the guy was very high in drugs, didn't understand the instructions, whatever. And they, they got through it. But I, it actually allowed me to say, it was it was a blessing, you know, in, in disguise. Only in the sense that I was able to say none of these places are perfect. This is not this is not about perfection. You know, uh, racism is not gone from Lancaster or Wilmer or any of these other places. What is going on is that they are generating enough resources, both financial and social, to be able to deal with these problems and contain them. That's what the difference is. I think that's a very important yeah. point because I notice frankly, a lot of my students and some of the parents of my students, yeah. that there's a lot of frustration. Yeah. And I hear all the time, why haven't we seen change? There's been 50 years right. of trying to take on racism and, and really move forward the agenda of inclusion. And you said something in your Wilmer article that, I, that struck a chord with mm -hmm. me. You said, the battle for inclusion is a daily struggle in Wilmer and across Minnesota. But if you're looking for a reason to be hopeful, it's the fact that in places like Wilmer, a lot of people want to get caught trying. Yeah. So that's kind of my view of life in general. Um, you know, you know um, I, I just reviewed Samantha Power's book. She was our former UN ambassador um, uh, for the New York Times. And she quoted President Obama because she was a real human rights advocate. Obama obviously was in a different place on Syria. You know, and this was a big stress. And she said at one point, uh, Obama turned to her and said, you know what, Samantha, better is good. Better is good, you know. Um, perfect is rarely on the menu, and um, so in, in in my life, um, uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I really hate giving interviews now because when I ever do them, the charge sheet comes out. Um, so there's, there's a sort of standard charge sheet against me. I was in London uh, a few months ago for my British publisher, and he asked me if I'd do an interview with a a, a British publication. I didn't want to do it. Um, but it's for the book, and I agreed to. And of course, at the end, the charge sheet came out, you know, because you can't interview me without being seen to have asked this question. Otherwise, you'll get hammered on Twitter. And the charge sheet is you supported the Iraq War, um, you supported MBS's reforms in Saudi Arabia, and you're way too excited about the Arab Spring. So I was actually getting up when these questions hit, because, and I said, um, you know, I, uh, this is a big question. It's kind of email the answer. Um, and I emailed this guy and said, you know, um, I think about what you were asking me. Um, uh, you asked me why I was too excited to get rid of one Arab dictator, too willing to tolerate another Arab dictator, and way too excited about getting rid of all the Arab dictators. So either I'm really messed up, um, or you don't see what I've been arguing. And what I've been arguing is that um, I believe if pluralism does not come to the Arab Muslim world, uh, it's going to wither. It's going to, it's going to hit a really dangerous wall. It looks like Syria, it looks like Libya, um, it looks like Somalia today. And um, wherever I have seen the opportunity to promote a crack of pluralism, because perfect is not on the agenda, I've done it. And um, that's what I'm about. And uh, I take full responsibility for that. And people who criticize me, I say, that's great. I get where you're coming from. But you better think where I'm coming from. I just wake up one day and say, let's bomb Iraq. I'd like to do that. Um, you know, it's about, it grows from a feeling that if, if we don't push opportunities for better, because um, perfect isn't even close to being on the menu there. So, and that's the same ethic I bring to this story. It is, and I think one of the uh, stirring themes in this series are the leaders that you profile yeah. in K-12 education, local community college that's struggling to get students, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and other businesses 
the foundations, the local foundations that realize, hey, here's a way I can actually make a difference and all the citizens that are, that are stepping forward. And the theme that I think really registered here, and I could see folks nodding their heads, was about checking politics. Yeah. And, you know, you said something in one of your columns that it kind of sad because I've been a reader of, of your column uh, much of my adult life. You said, um, I never thought I'd end my career covering a civil war in America. Yeah, well, that's, that was the real, the uber backstory to this whole project was I covered the Middle East, you know, for so much of my career. And um, I woke up and realized that everything I had supported failed, um, basically, if I were honest with myself. You just go check right down the list, you know, Camp David, Oslo, Arab Spring, uh, democracy in Iraq. Actually, it's actually doing pretty well now, actually, in an amazing way, but never mind. Um, you sort of name it, I supported it, it failed. Um, and uh, so I decided to come home to America. And I um, wrote a book with my friend Michael Mandelbaum called That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way and the World It Invented and How We Can Come Back. I, just, I said, I'm going to try to work on my own country now. I clearly have no uh, you know, insight into shaping this part of the world. So, um, uh, and um, uh, you know, I sort of brought my, and I coined the term nation building at home because I took the, that, what I was trying to do there to nation building at home. And then I woke up one day and discovered the Middle East had followed me home, that we were now Sunnis and Shiites. We just called each other Democrats and Republicans, but it was the same kind of tribalism I saw in the Middle East. So thank you for being late came from my desire to actually go back to the roots of my optimism. This little community, um, Minneapolis and St. Louis Park where I grew up. And first of all, to see if I just remembered it in a gauzy way and that it really was, it was just fake. I just remembered it in a romantic way or if something really real was going on there that was differentiated, and I could then take that and reverse engineer it you know, back into broader American politics. That's where the book came from. You know, that was sort of the intellectual journey I'd been on. You know, uh, I left Minnesota in 1971 to discover the world, and I came back to St. Louis Park High in you know, 2014 and discovered the world had discovered St. Louis Park, and you know, my high school now is all these Somali, you know, Karen, you know, Hmong, just amazing diversity, you know. And to me, it's a microcosm of what's happened in the world. Because what these climate changes are doing is that they're bringing more and more people together faster than ever. And faster in some cases than we can actually adapt to. You know, in, 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 in miniature, Larry, you know, a lot of Americans, are, when people say, where did Donald Trump come from? I say, here's where he came from. Uh, over the last 10 years, a lot of Americans, you know, went to the grocery store and they went to the cashier and and if it was a woman, she, she might not have been wearing a baseball cap. Then they went into the men's room and there was, there was a woman next to them and she seemed to have a penis. And then they went to the office and their boss rolled a robot up next to their desk and it seemed to be studying their job. All this happened at the same time. My sense of home, my sense of social norms and, and traditions and um, uh, uh, sexual roles and my sense of work all got disrupted at the same time. Well, is it any wonder that someone named Donald Trump came along and said, I can stop the wind. The wall is a metaphor for so much more than just Mexico. It was a brilliant, by the way, advertising metaphor for I can stop all this change that is making you uncomfortable. You know, And, um, and I think that that's, so for me, what community is all about is I think a lot of people today are, um, un, unmoored, unanchored. I want to bring, I love this world of cultural diversity. I think it makes us so much more resilient. I love a world where people, whatever their sexual orientation is, can feel comfortable in their body and their community in any way they want. And I, I want a world where we're keeping up with the change of the, of the workforce. But I live, you just described my world. I'm, I'm, that's who I am. But not everyone is like that. And we have to find ways to bring people along and to anchor them as we go through this incredible transition. Now you have a natural optimism. You tend to see opportunities and you want to use your uh, uh, platform, the New York Times, put a spotlight on it. But you've also acknowledged that when communities are not embracing inclusion, when they're not moving beyond their partisan uh, politics, uh, and they are not recognizing and accurately responding to this new global world, bad things are going to happen. They're going to die. Um, and, and I think, you know, you mentioned uh, St. Cloud 
um, which has had some real problems yeah. on both those fronts. Uh, we've seen in our Courageous Conversations project that the Iron Range, which had been home for this great diversifying force a century ago, is now really struggling with so bringing in right. yeah. uh, new Americans. Yeah. Uh, and in many ways, the Donald Trump wall, uh, yeah. something they want, even you know, so many thought hundreds of miles from, from the border with Mexico. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I would say, could, could you do me, somebody do me a favor and just bring me my backpack there. I just want to pull out something from my backpack. It's right there. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Matt. And this is my friend, Matt Dunn, who, who I dragged along on this trip to Red Wing. Matt runs the Center for Rural Innovation in Vermont, and he is working in Red Wing, and he's the one who got me to Red Wing. So if any of you come to my office and you're in a small town, you're going to be responsible for taking me there. So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I recently, if I told you this, Larry, I changed my business card. Um, let's see if I got it here. Yeah, I got it here. So I used to be, my business card used to say Thomas L. Friedman, New York Times, um, foreign affairs columnist. Uh, now it says Thomas L. Friedman, New York Times, humiliation, dignity, trust, leadership, culture, community, ownership, amplification, and deep columnist. Okay. Um, it's, it's very it's catchy. Like, I, I, it's, it's very I, catchy. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, true, right there. it's your bumper sticker if you have a big enough bumper. And um, uh, uh, so actually, uh, so, so the reason um, for that is, and, and this is, you know, one of the things I, I um, uh, so I'll say one uh, slightly immodest thing. I'm a little Jewish guy from St. Louis Park, and I'm probably one of the most widely read columnists in the Arab Muslim world. Not a natural thing, okay? Um, and uh, uh, and the, so one thing I had to learn was how to talk to people who are very different and, um, from me, and I'm very different from them, and enter in their trust. Um, and so uh, I am, uh, whenever young people come to me and say, hey, I want to do what you do, uh, what do I need to know? I say, well, you need to type fast. I can type really fast. Matt saw me this morning. I went to Knight Secretarial School of London, where I type fast. Um, uh, the second is you have to like people. I really like people. And if you hang around me, you will notice, and Larry has, I take my notebook with me everywhere, and I'll interview you wherever you are, okay? If you come up to me, I will interview you because I really like people, and if you can't hear the music, you can't play the music. And so when you like people, they like you back, and they tend to open up, and they tell you their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their crazy aspirations, everything. But um, there's uh, the most important thing I think you need to be a successful journalist is that um, you have to be a good listener. And it's for two reasons, and the second reason is more important than the first. Uh, the first reason is what you learn when you listen. You learn a lot. Boy, I learned a lot listening in Red Wing this morning. But the second much more important is what you say when you listen. <clears throat> Listening is a sign of respect. And it's amazing what people will let you say to them if they think you respect them. And if they think you don't respect them, you cannot tell them the sky is blue. And one thing I can tell you, uh, people uh, in the Arab world know, um, I really respect them. I, I, in fact, I have high expectations for them. Um, uh, and I'm a good listener. And when I'm done listening, I will say, though, what I think. And they know that, but they know it doesn't come from wanting to put them down. And that's true if you're in a miner in northern Minnesota or a coal miner in Virginia. Um, and I think one thing we failed those people from a political point of view is I thought, you know, if I were Hillary Clinton and I were going to West Virginia, you know, three and a half years ago to a mine, a coal mining town, you know, how would I approach it? I would have come into town and said and meet with coal miners. I think I'd begun the conversation by saying, you know, I just drove up here. You know, the vistas here are just amazing. They're stunning. Just stunning. I drove through town and, um, you know, we stopped at a, one of the bars. They were playing country music. You know, awesome. I know why you don't want to talk about climate change. It doesn't have anything to do with climate change. It's because you want to stay home. You want to stay with these vistas, this family, this culture, this music, this food. I don't blame you for that at all. I'd want to stay here too. So let me make you a deal. Give me a chance to see if I can enable you to stay home, stay connected to your community by moving to renewable energy. And if I can't, you know what? Uh, I'll help you in any way as a coal miner, mine coal. But give me that chance. Because people don't listen through their ears. They listen through their stomach. If you connect with them on a gut level, they aren't interested in the details. They trust you. And if you don't connect on the gut level, 
they always want to see more details. That's Hillary Clinton telling people to go to her website, you know. Um, and <laughs> Donald Trump didn't even have a website, you know what I mean? Um, uh, and so you've got to respect people where they are. And um, uh, so that's where it starts. Tom Friedman started covering the Middle East back in 1979. And all the traveling he described from China to Red Wing, he's done that many, many, many times in the Middle East. And uh, if you read his columns or have the opportunity to talk to him, you'll see how many of those leaders he knows both in government and down that kind of those coalitions that he's been talking about. So I'm wondering if we could shift a little bit, uh, cover some of the Middle Eastern topics, by the way, this is the most fun thing about talking with Tom Freeman. You can travel the world. <laughs> um, so let's start with the Iran agreement. Um, and this is going to come back to a lot of the themes we're talking about. Um, you were, I would say, a kind of pragmatic, supportive skeptic of yeah. the 2005 uh, Iran deal. Um, now you've seen that deal kind of uh, tossed in the trash can. And we're seeing, uh, you know, really pretty scary instability and the threat of some fairly serious repercussions. How do you size it up today, 2019? Uh, so a quick backstory, I don't know if you've ever told this. Um, the uh, day the Iran wheel deal was uh, announced um, uh, with President Obama, it was, actually, it was inked at 3 in the morning, I think, in Vienna, and I got a call from the White House at 5 in the morning and said, the President wants you in the Oval Office. At 11 o'clock, he wants to give you the first interview on the Iran deal. And I had broken my shoulder uh, eight days earlier. And I was on OxyContin. I was completely in pain and completely <laughs> drugged up. But I was not going to miss this. So um, uh, I got my daughter, Natalie, who's now executive producer of All Things Considered, Weekend Edition at NPR, uh, to, to, to sneak off work and to carry my notebook and everything. And we were doing this uh, on camera, too, to be broadcast for The New York Times. And I got to, if you actually watch it on film, you'll notice I don't move the left side of my body at all. You know? And I was completely high, OK? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and there, um, when we got done, I said to the president, I said, Mr. President, that's my, that, that woman over there holding my stuff is actually my daughter. And he said, oh, that's so great. Come on, Natalie. We took her into the Oval Office, got a picture with her. you know. And then between the Oval Office and sort of the secretary's room, there's a, there's a little hallway. And, and Natalie went out, and he stopped me in the hallway, and he said, Friedman, I need your support on this Iran deal. And there were three of him, and they were all pointing at me. You know, it was just like, you know. So uh, I waited a couple of weeks, and I really studied it. And I came down, um, uh, not wildly enthusiastic, but um, I, I did support it. And I don't regret that at all. So to talk about the Iran deal, uh, I, again, I'm going to put it in, I'm going to widen the aperture. Donald Trump has actually decided to take on two of the oldest civilizations on the planet at once, Persia and China. Okay, that's basically what we're doing. Um, and um, in both cases, he's actually created enormous leverage on China through tariffs and on Iran through sanctions. But here is where, Obama, where, where, where uh, Trump's domestic politics is going to intersect with this. So Trump decided, and is never varied from this, that he does not want to be president of the United States. He wants to be president of his base. And he's never acted otherwise. I am president of my 40%. I don't care about the rest of the country. Now, um, the, that is going to come back to haunt him, and it is right now. Why? Because every time he's been presented with a bipartisan deal, Nancy Pelosi on immigration, we'll give you money for your wall, but you've got to give us money for dreamers and, and, um, uh, and, and immigrants. Um, what happened? It takes one Ann Coulter to blog that you are abandoning the base, and he runs away. Guns. 95% of Republicans say they want common sense gun laws after these three succession of terrible massacres. One call from the head of the NRA, he runs away because he thinks it's going to eat away at his base. So what's his problem with Iran and China? They're, they're identical problems. To get a deal with two of the oldest civilizations on the planet, you're going to have to compromise. Okay. Um, it's not going to be win-lose. It's going to be win-win or there's not going to be any deal at all. And um, he can't do that. He's literally said, watch me as I win and she loses. And he's saying that to the Iranians. Watch me as they grovel to my feet. That's just not going to happen. And um, it's going to have to be some kind of win-win. And that's where he runs up right against his domestic politics. As you've written, the story about the 2015 denuclearization agreement had pros and cons. 
it was an effort to slow down for a discrete period of time the building of nukes by Iran. On the other hand, there was no effort to really rein in the terrorism that Iran exports to its neighborhood. And you could look at the 2015 agreement and say it has succeeded in the first part. It slowed down the uh, nuclear program in Iran, but it failed the second part. So Donald Trump comes in with his group of folks, and they said it failed in the second part. Are they wrong about that? So, yeah, Donald Trump came in. You could say, and again, this is so complicated because I believe if the, if the Shah of Iran were in power, he'd be in Syria and Lebanon today because of the dysfunctionality of the Sunni Arab world. That it's so dysfunctional, it's such soft tissue. You have such a superior power in Iran. It was inevitably going to move into that vacuum. So you see the breakup of Syria and whatnot. And, and, um, so let's just do a quick mapping of the regions. because Iran, not, Syria, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. So, um, this is the Shia arc. Right, now yeah. But I, I, so I would say, you know, number one, that. Um, number two, um, here's what I would have done if I had been Trump. I would have come to the Russians, the Chinese, and the Europeans, French, Germans, and British, who are my partners in the deal. And I would have said, I would have, I would have pointed out, you know, we... Um, uh, Iran has been expanding its influence there, even though it's abiding 100% by the nuclear deal. So here's what I want to do. I want to come to the Iranians um, and tell them that we want to add 15 more years to the deal. It's now, it's now 15 years of denuclearization. I want to make it 30. And I want to limit on all your missile testing to the radius of the Middle East. You know, if you, if you had done that, and, and, and until they do that, I'm going to keep sanctions on. First of all, you would have kept a wall-to-wall -wall global coalition. And then you would have so triggered a debate in Tehran. Oh my God, you would have blown up the whole leadership because people would be saying, well, let's take it. I don't want to get rid of, lose all our oil income. And you could have, and then he could have said, I got something Obama didn't get. I got him from 15 to 30 years. And also if you had approached it that way, you would have triggered a huge, you would have uh, leveraged Iranian reformers on your side. Now, when you go to war with them, what do you do? You force every reformer there to wave the, the flag of the Ayatollahs. Exact same thing with China. That's the way you have to see these identical problems. With China, what did I say? I'm with you on, we needed to rebalance our trade with China. Here's how I would have done it. I would have signed the Trans-Pacific Trade Deal. I would have gotten 40% of global GDP on my side on American rules, the most modern, progressive trade deal in the world. Then I would have gone to the Europeans and said, the EU, you guys have the same problem we do. I would have lined up a about 70% of global GDP. Then I would have called the Chinese. I said, let's meet in secret on Hainan Island. You send your guys, I'm gonna send my guys. I got the Europeans and all 12 of the biggest economies on the Pacific, and we're gonna negotiate a new trade arrangement. We're both gonna come out and say, it was win-win. But privately, I'm gonna nail you, okay? But we're gonna come out and say win-win. Now, if you'd done that, you'd have triggered all of the reformers in China who actually want China to change, they'd be on your side. But instead, what did he do? He makes them wave Xi Jinping's flag and turns it into a nationalist fight and who's got the biggest terror. And so um, uh, it's just, it's stupid. Um, and um, uh, it's Donald Trump is not smart. He thinks he's smart and he's actually stupid. So, um, and, um, and I'm not, and, and I, it's just like, this is what I write, I'm not saying this for your benefit. It's just, and, and, and think about it, you know I mean? And now he's got a team around him. None of them will, you know, the, the, he had kind of the B-plus team, got rid of them. Then he kind of had the C-plus team. Now he's got the D team. He's got people who literally stepped over the bodies of people with a Twitter knife in their back. And like, oh, geez, whoa. And saying, oh, I don't want any of that. You know what I mean? So like, whatever you want, Mr. President, you know. And um, that's just a, so there's no one there to say, um, this is really doesn't make sense. China... Um, and the Middle East are part of a really almost nonpartisan um, debate over the last couple decades about the need to rebalance is the phrase that Absolutely. was used uh, a lot of foreign policy circles. That is to take our energy out of and our resources and our troops and shift them more to the, uh, the region around China, including South China Sea, which is so explosive. Um, and you've talked that we should have struck or continue to strike a kind of transactional um, deal, negotiation yes. with Iran precisely in order to make this possible. Better is good. Um, you've also made it clear 
um, that the, the challenge with China is real. Yeah. This is not Donald Trump being a no, crazy no. person. And so I think Trump is actually right what he says. I shouldn't even have had to deal with this. This should have been done by George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And he's right about that. What is the, what is the, epi- the, the kind of existential threat for the 21st century so basically, China. that's a good question. So I, I would argue that in just simple form, China got rich over the last 30 years, um, uh, went from, I, I should say, poverty to middle income by using three, three, three uh, sort of buckets. Bucket number one was hard work, um, really hard work, um, uh, delayed gratification, um, smart investments in infrastructure, and smart investments in education. They really have done some really smart, impressive things. Bucket number one. Bucket number two, stealing other people's intellectual property, non-reciprocal trade agreements, non-fulfillment of WTO rulings against them, um, and, um, uh, you know, general abuse of of the trading relationship. And the third bucket was the U.S. Pacific fleet. Because our fleet's presence in the Pacific assured all of China's neighbors that China could dominate them economically, but it would never dominate them politically. They should have been paying for the Pacific fleet. Now, China then has become, uh, over these last 30 years, and I think this is a wonderful thing, a technological powerhouse. Um, They've said, we actually, they have this plan, China 2020, um, uh, where we want to, or 2025, excuse me, where we want to um, lead the world in AI, robotics, um, 5G, um, software, um, supercomputing chips, all the things that we do. If we let China use the same strategy that it did to get from middle in, from poverty to middle income, to go from middle income to high income, we'd be crazy. Um, and it would be economically suicidal. So somebody had to call the game. And, um, uh, but again, you can't reverse this shit, you know, and look, this is, a, this is a real problem. I was in China a year ago, April, for a high level dialogue at Tsinghua. It was labeled as a dialogue on Xi Jinping thought, but um, it was actually a really interesting dialogue it was myself, Neil Ferguson, Kishor Mababani, Carl Bernstein, and um, Mar- Martin Wolf from the Financial Times on one side of the table and uh, some of the top China economic people on the other side of the table. And at the beginning of the conversation, I actually just, I said to them what I just said now, we need to rebalance this thing. And a senior Chinese official who I quoted, uh, you can see it in the column, said to me, um, Mr. Friedman, excuse me, you're too late, we're too big. I said, oh, oh, really? I said, that's not humble. Be careful. That's not humble. So that's like a real statement in Beijing from a real, you know, Chinese leader. And so we have a real issue here. Now, the issue isn't only what they do, it's what we do. Do we invest in Red Wing and Wilmer and Minneapolis and the St. Paul and in infrastructure and education? That's all part of it. When have you heard Trump talk about that? You know what I mean? Um, We've kind of wasted four years talking about Donald Trump, you know, and... um, and, and just, not these these other things. Just to go matter. back into the China part, just to make that nut even tighter, the Chinese Communist Party leadership depends on this right. parasitic relationship that it's developed with the United States and other Western countries. The reason that they are capturing our intellectual property and, and have established this highly imbalanced trading relationship is to benefit, in large part, the Communist Party. Yeah. So um, it's China today is so much more open than it was 30 years ago, Larry, and it is so much more closed than it was five years ago. And that's the problem. Since Xi Jinping came in in 2013, that's what triggered Hong Kong, because Hong Kong looked at that and they thought, we all thought, oh, we'll, we'll just keep trading with them, they'll be more open, blah, blah, blah. And then Xi Jinping just took a U-turn. And the, the young people in Hong Kong said, don't, don't bring that here. Um, so that's what triggered that. So we actually have two problems with China, that's that one that we thought they were on a slow path toward becoming more like us, and he just put a right turn in there. And uh, the other is the, what I call the Huawei problem. So you know, Huawei is China's biggest telecommunications company. They're sort of a combination of Cisco and AT&T and uh, Qualcomm. You know? uh, and so they make cell phones, they're the, biggest, they're the second largest cell phone maker in the world um, uh, after Samsung and, and uh, um, behind uh, and ahead of Apple. Uh, but they also make 5G. Uh, infrastructure equipment. Well, there's only 5G, there's only three companies, and there were four basically, if you count Samsung, but that's just a sort of, they're called Ericsson, Nokia, and Huawei, who make 5G. Well, that's, in other words, folks, there is, is no American 5G manufacturer. 
Um, so, um, and Huawei is about 25% less in cost than, um, uh, than Ericsson and Nokia. And Huawei's wired Britain. Uh, they wired parts of France and they're wiring all of Africa and a lot of Asia. So the reason I went to Shenzhen to interview the founder of Huawei is, um, you know, Trump has basically said, um, you are a vehicle for espionage and you will never eat in this town again. So, um, uh, so let me reverse engineer the Huawei story because you really need to understand Huawei. It's actually the tip of a giant iceberg. So, so what is the iceberg? So I believe technology moves up in steps like that. Um, and each step is biased toward a certain set of capabilities. So back in 2000, a set of capabilities came together that were biased toward connectivity. And that was because of the dot-com boom bubble and bus collapsed the price of fiber optic cable. And we accidentally wired the world. Honey didn't mean to, but I shrunk the world. And um, suddenly I could touch people I could never touch before. And I could be touched by people who could never touch me before. And I came along, gave that moment a name. I said, it feels like the world is flat. Around 2007, we took another step up. It was biased toward complexity because another price collapse, a collapse in the price of compute and storage, allowed us to abstract away complexity in everything. Suddenly, with one touch, one touch, I could page a taxi, direct a taxi, pay a taxi, rate a taxi, and be rated by a taxi. <laughs> in one touch of my phone. Do you realize the complexity that it was abstracted away? Well, that's actually happened everywhere. So we've taken sand out of the gears of everything and put in grease. So the world went from flat to fast. Then 2018, 2015, we started to put sensors everywhere. Now the price collapsed, the price of sensors and connecting to the cloud collapsed so we could actually make everything intelligent. And so the world went from flat to fast to smart. Now, um, my wife is building a word museum in Washington, D.C. For any of you who come there in the spring, it's called Planet Word. My wife's a real word person. It's about le reading, literacy, and love of language because we believe without a healthy, literate public, you cannot sustain a democracy. So my wife's really into words and, um, uh, and language. And so she comes to me every year and always says, guess what the word of the year is? Because um, the online dictionaries can now track what is the most searched word. And last year, the most looked up word on Webster's Merriman, I believe it was, was justice. More people looked up the meaning of justice last year. So I did a column in which I said, I will tell you what the word of the year is for 2019. You can close the contest now. <laughs> and that word is deep. Have you noticed how many things we're applying the word adjective deep to? Deep fake, deep state, deep surveillance, deep mind, deep research, deep insight, deep medicine. We're actually applying the word deep to everything. That's because when the world goes from fast to flat to smart, it starts to go deep. We're going deep into everything, and we use that word because we know we're actually able to do things now that are almost science fiction. And we can't figure out any other word for it. We're just calling everything deep. I can fake your image now so well, Larry, that you and I can't tell the difference. That is deep. I can... I, I, I can I can adapt your DNA. Um, I can do things deep. And for those of you who, uh, as I do believe in popular culture, you may have noticed that the song of the year last year that won the Academy Award was called Shallow by Lady Gaga. <laughs> but listen to the words. We're off on the deep end now. We've left the shallows. Watch as I dive in. I'm far from the shore. We're far from the shallow now. Oh, baby, we are far from the shallow now. <laughs> now, why is this important? So um, I'll connect it to something else. I'm really good friends with the people who run the college board. And a couple of years ago, they decided that um, there were two SAT2s that they thought every high school student should have to take. They called them their two codes, how to code a computer and the code of the US Constitution. They thought those two should go together. And I would argue that the people who run Facebook are walking, living, breathing example of people who took the first course and not the second, okay? <laughs> that, and the, what we're living through now is technology is going deep at the pace of Moore's law, but the rules, norms, standards, and regulations to manage that are all analog, and we're living in the gap between where Mark Zuckerberg is taking us and the kind of rules, norms, and standards we need to govern where Facebook is going. So the world's gone from flat to fast to smart to deep. Now, what does that have to do with China? So for 30 years, China sold us. <laughs> Sorry, this is my head works, folks. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> Poor Matt's been with me all morning. He's so dizzy. He can't wait to get out of, out of my sight. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, this is how I connected to China. So for 30 years, I would argue China sold us shallow goods. They sold us shirts, shoes, socks, tennis shoes, solar panels we put on the outside. They, they sold us surface goods. But now what does Huawei represent? They want to sell us deep stuff. Oh, you put 5G in my, in my house. That's buried in the sidewalk. You put a Huawei bot in my bedroom. You're in my bedroom. You are deep inside of me. But we in China do not have the trust framework for us to buy their deep stuff. And that's why the Huawei story is so important. They had to buy our deep stuff because they didn't have a choice. So we got to sell them phones and software and computers and telecom. And now they're saying, but now we're as good as you. We want to sell you our deep stuff. And Trump is saying, I don't trust you. I don't trust you to be deep inside me. We're almost out of time. I want to ask one last question. Please. You've spent so many years uh, watching, studying, writing of Israel. Um, and there's a lot to be talked about and fascinating. Uh, but we don't have time for it. I want to ask you about development just in the last day, which is uh, we saw the uh, coalition of Arab uh, parties come out and say they would not support Netanyahu. Now, these are Arab parties. Actually, the opposite. They will support Gantz, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even more, more importantly, they say yeah, the they, opponent, his opponent. The, his opponent is a way to block right, yeah. Netanyahu from becoming, uh, for making the first effort to form a government. This is important in several respects. One is Arabs, Israeli Arabs, using the ballot box, very important. Always look for the ballot box approach rather than the alternatives. But secondly, and I think, and I wonder what you think of this, the... Um, Perhaps um, telling example for the United States, Republican Party, and Donald Trump of the consequences of Netanyahu running a virulently racist campaign, anti-Arab yeah. campaign. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of messages in the, in the bottle of that, uh, of that. First of all, again, sometimes you just have to love Trump because after the election was over and it was clear Netanyahu had lost, you, Trump was asked, what do you think? He said, Netanyahu, Neta I used to know a deli owner named Netanyahu. <laughs> he was at 48th and Lex, um, you know. Uh, I mean, he didn't say that. What he said was, uh, our relationships with Israel. It's, it's just like, it was just such a stiletto. You know I mean? And this guy who just, he likes winners. If you're not a winner, goodbye, including Netanyahu. So I actually quite enjoyed that. Um, uh, two lessons, though, for Trump in, the, in that fortune cookie of the Israeli election. Uh, the first is Netanyahu ran an overtly racist, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim campaign, I, I would argue. And, um, and, and the Arabs, I mean, Israeli Arabs, God bless them, said, oh, oh, you talking to me? You talking to me that way? Well, here's my vote. And they became the third largest party in Israel. And, um, uh, and that, that's um, a message to Trump. Um, if you think this divisive stuff, if people, you don't think people are listening and they won't take their revenge? Um, uh, and the second is, uh, so Benny Gantz, who led the blue and white coalition that ran against um, uh, um, uh, Netanyahu, I mean, uh, what's, what would be the right analogy? I mean, he makes um, Michael Bennett, uh, running for president, seem like a wild and crazy guy, okay? I mean, just, uh, um, I mean, Benny Gantz is... I mean, you do have to put that mirror there sometimes to see if he's breathing. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> he's just really low-key, doesn't know anything about social media. And for the last three months, all the people are saying, you got it, because Netanyahu was out there everywhere, every day. Um, he, he violated the election rules. He was on Twitter, Facebook, radio, everywhere, all the time. And it turns out, Israelis got sick of him. And at the margin... He lost three seats. Those that three seat flip, I believe, had to do with the fact it was just too much. And Trump ought to think about that too. That, yeah, hey, it's great because everyone said Netanyahu just sucked up all the airspace and no one even knew about Gantz. Turns out Israelis knew about Gantz. So, um, you know, uh, it, that's what I love about journalism, you know, that people, God bless them, have bodies and souls. And the minute you think you can feed one and not the other, you always get in trouble and they always surprise you. We have run out of time. I want to make just a few uh, quick uh, comments and thank our guests. Uh, if you like this program, we've got 
large number coming up in the fall. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, one of the leading acts in the country here talking about uh, women athletics and sport. If you follow the women's soccer team, this is going to be a terrific conversation about um, about the um, uh, that team, about uh, Title IX, and um, what Mary Jo Kane says is a shrinking gap between the performance of men and women in certain sports. Mm. So if you look at the, Bo the Boston Marathon, the fastest woman had the 11th best time out mm. of over 1,000 uh, runners. Ramesh Ponaru, who is senior editor at the National Review, will be here talking about the future of conservatism, a uh, very important topic, and I'm very excited about having Ramesh. And there are a lot of other programs we have coming up. You can watch it. I want to give a particular thing. These programs do not happen. And you put on a program, 18 months, traveling all over the state with a citizen's commission, included legislators and these great folks who volunteer their time um, and the folks you heard from earlier. This takes people. It takes resources and would not have been possible without the McKnight Foundation and Kate Wolford. If you see Kate, please thank her. I want to thank you all for having uh, come and for your great sense of humor and your intelligence. Uh, we count on that. Yeah. Um, and then Tom Friedman. Remarkable. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought I'm glad we did. It's all related. It's all related. It's all related. You see how that Huawei story and deep, oh, it's all just all connected. Hey. Wow.